Hello and welcome to another episode of the Opus Well Style Podcast. My name is Ivan Watanabe here with my wonderful partner, Evan. Evan, what's going on, man? How are you? Doing great. It's a great day. How are you doing? It's a beautiful day. I'm great, man. I'm great. Um, so we are really excited on the topic and also to have a great friend on, Chet Schwartz. Uh, Chet, what's going on? How are things? Things are well. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we are really excited to have you on today to come talk about one of the most misunderstood, poorly understood, um, controversial, potentially subjects that are hitting all kinds of headlines, um, social media, news, you know, uh, newsletters. Um, we're going to talk about Bitcoin today. We're going to talk about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, talk about the blockchain a little bit. And our hope is that... Um, you'll be able to kind of demystify a lot of the information that's out there. Again, for the listening audience, just to be super clear, not making any type of recommendations. We're not making any suggestions that you should or shouldn't participate in these markets, um, but really just want you to leave with uh, some understanding and some clarity around sort of what it is. And so we're, we're really excited to invite on Chet Schwartz. Um, again, Chet is a colleague, a wonderful planner, advisor, for his clients and one of the few people that I trust to do the level of research necessary to basically boil a very complex concept into something that even I can understand. So again, Chet, welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you on. Thanks. And uh, yeah, look, there's there's a lot to cover. Not a not a whole lot of time to get it in. Um, but look, I, I think anybody that approaches this conversation should probably approach it initially with some sort of skepticism or even cynicism. Like it's it is a very complex topic. It's a relatively new technology. Uh, when I got into the space, I certainly approached it with the same sort of perspective. And uh, you know, but by by my best estimate, I've probably put in a couple thousand hours of work here uh, between podcasts and YouTube videos and books and conferences and blogs and anything I can get my ears and eyes on. Um, so my hope is I'm, I'm going to somehow be able to take a couple thousand hours of work and boil it down into something that is organized, digestible, understandable about Bitcoin. All right. Um, so I want to share some slides, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's awesome. And again, for those of you that are tuning in through normal sort of our, our audio podcast, we're going to make sure to link the YouTube channel so that you can see all of Chet's slides if you are you know, in the car right now listening. So to, uh, to, to get started here, um, you know, I would say that, look, there, there's, there's a ways I would approach this is that there are two Bitcoins here. There is the lower B Bitcoin and there's the uppercase B Bitcoin. And um, what I mean by that is I would consider the lower case B Bitcoin to be the token the token is what uh, we, I think we hear the most about. The token is the pricing that we see, the pricing, the social, you know, what we see reported on the news, social media, Avon, as you were talking about before. Uppercase B, uh, Bitcoin is the network. And in, in order to understand any potential value that lowercase B, Bitcoin, the token has, you have to first understand what the network is all about. Because the, the network is what gives value to the token. And without the network, there is no token. Right. So um, with that, I, I want to throw out just to start with some terminology that, um, you know, your listeners or you may have heard of as it relates to Bitcoin um, and get that out of the way. And then we'll peel the onion back a little bit more and talk about uh, what some of this means. So the first thing that you may have heard is that the, the network is what's called permissionless. And what permissionless means is anybody from anywhere can join the network or what I would call the monetary network. So. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, people like us have no problem walking into a bank and, and being able to transact within that bank. There are literally billions of people around the world that are unbanked. You know, they don't have a dependable or established currency or banking system that they can safely park money or hold on to money. So this monetary system gives people everywhere around the world, as long as they have a smartphone, the opportunity to be a part of the very same system that we're a part of. So that's what permissionless means. The second thing is it, it's called a distributed ledger. And what a distributed ledger is, is a ledger that uh, accounts for, excuse me, all transactions on the network. And anybody can view um, 
what that ledger looks like. Because because it's permissionless, anybody can veer in and anybody can look at all the transactions and anybody can verify the transactions on that ledger. So when we talk about a distributed ledger, it's just something that everybody has access to and there's only one ledger. <clears throat> the third thing is that it's considered trustless. And a trustless network, in order to understand what that is, uh, it helps to understand the, the, the current uh, dynamics that we operate in, in the current banking system, where if my money is with uh, you know Bank A, my bank keeps a ledger of their own. Um, and that ledger keeps track of all the debits and credits of my account and all the other accounts of all their other customers. But if I want to transfer money from my bank to Avon's bank, and Avon is in Bank B, a completely different institution, they have a different ledger with different debits and credits. And what happens is, if I want to transfer money from one ledger to another ledger, it takes time to reconcile that. We need a trusted third party or intermediary to make sure that if I am sending money to Avon, that something is able to verify that the money is there. Um, it also wants to make sure that if I send the money to Avon, there isn't something called a double spend where I don't try to simultaneously send the same funds to Evan. So that is why it often takes days for an ACH or a check or even a wire to clear because banks are all working off of different ledgers and there are thousands of banks with thousands of different ledgers and they all need to reconcile each other. Because the Bitcoin network is one single distributed ledger, it eliminates the need for having that trusted third party or intermediary for transactions to occur because everybody shares the same exact ledger and everybody can verify exactly what transactions are occurring, exactly how many tokens are operating or circulating on the network. Um, and it, it, it sort of uh, minimizes a lot of the complexities that we're used to dealing with day to day in the current banking system. And because it is a distributed permissionless network where we don't need a trusted third party, it's also referred to as a peer-to-peer -peer network. And what that means is without the, ne the necessity of another bank getting in the middle of things, I can send money directly to Avon and money being in the form of a token. I can send money uh, directly to Evan. I can send money directly to anybody, anywhere in the world, anytime. And finally, the network runs 24 seven. So when I'm sending money from one person to another, I can do that uh, any time of day, any time of night, uh, any day of the week, any holiday, the network never shuts down. It's always operating. So those are some of the, the, the high level you know, terms that I think are important for distinguishing some of the elements that make up this network and why it's starting to get so much attention. Um, before I move on, any questions there? Any comments? No, I mean, I think I think you know, I think you're establishing a good baseline for the audience just to kind of understand why 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 this is an even why this is even a solution, right? To to a potential problem. And I think you're going to kind of go through what what the challenges are within the normal traditional banking system as we kind of have it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so. To, to build on that, uh, you know, so what is Bitcoin? It's it's the most widely adopted decentralized digital money, right? It's a digital form of money. Um, and it operates on a decentralized network of computers using blockchain, blockchain technology, which is uh, a little complicated. But what decentralized means is there's no one government running this. There's no one business running this. There's no one computer that this runs on. It actually literally runs on a network of computers, uh, tens of thousands, if not by now, you know, over 100,000 different computers. And again, all of those computers are operating and sharing the same one ledger. So even if a country were to come in and say, hey, you can no longer use Bitcoin, it's not going to affect the network itself, because as long as you have multiple computers running somewhere, you're going to be able to operate that network. You're going to be able to operate that, that blockchain. Um, now, now, a blockchain is... Uh, the, you know, and this could be a whole podcast in itself, but there there are blocks which can which contain a number of transactions. Every ten minutes in the in the in the Bitcoin network, a new block gets created, and that block gets connected to the previous block. And the, the best analogy I can think of of what that means is um, earlier this year with my family, we flew into Miami, we took a drive up um, out to the Keys, and what's interesting is that it's like a two hundred mile you know roadway system. And along the roadway system is a very large network of uh, 
power poles, like poles connecting wires that, that provide electricity to the entire chain of islands. And if, if, if each one of those poles represented a block in the chain, what would happen is if you took out any one of those poles, it would disrupt electricity and energy to the rest of the island, to the entire chain of, you know, the, the entire system. Um, and that would immediately alert everybody that something is wrong and it would have to be repaired. And the blockchain works in a similar way that if, if somebody were to try to go in and change a block or take out a block, the network of computers would immediately recognize that and would quickly work to correct it so that nothing amiss were occur, would, would, would occur or, or nobody could come in and try to do something that would be um, you know, less than honest in the blockchain. So this decentralized network of computers actually enhances the security of the network. The larger the network, the more secure the network is. Um, and after 15 years, it's certainly a more secure network than it was when it first started. And, and, and the, the amount of computers operating, it was much smaller. Uh, the other component is that it's a it's a open source protocol, which is just a fancy word for saying it's like a computer code that anybody can look inside of it, see exactly what that code says, how it works, and the things that can occur or not occur that could ever change that code. Uh, importantly, as mentioned before, it's not controlled by any central authority, right? So uh, there is no central bank making decisions. There is no board of directors making decisions. Uh, there is no company making decisions. This is a autonomous protocol operating as the protocol says that it should operate without anybody getting involved and making sure that that, that occurs. So uh, what that means is there's no counterparty risk here. We're not taking on somebody's liability. We're not taking on, um, you know, the chances that a board of directors or a management team doesn't come through and kind of screws up on the execution. Uh, we're not counting on a government uh, to fulfill on certain promises. Uh, it's a network that operates on its own. And finally, in a very important uh, component of this, is that the Bitcoin, little b Bitcoin, uh, has a known fixed supply of 21 million units. And I will talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but that is important because more than just having a scarce asset, <clears throat> this is the first time I'm aware where a finite asset has been created. So by comparison, you know, a central bank can print, create an issue, virtually unlimited amounts of currency, right? There's nothing from stopping our Fed from putting trillions of dollars of additional currency into our economy. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, a publicly traded company can issue more and more and more stock, and that will dilute the existing shareholders of the value of the existing stock that, that they had before. Uh, Bitcoin is often referred to as like digital gold, right? So, so gold has its value very much in the element of its scarcity, right? Gold, no matter how long it's been around and no matter what our technology is, has been expanding at somewhere around a two to three percent, uh, two to three percent rate a year. So its inflationary rate is around two to three percent a year in terms of how much it can expand. But we don't know for sure exactly how much gold is in the Earth, or the Moon, or a passing meteor that we could possibly mine, or even the universe because it's a naturally occurring element. So even where gold is scarce, it is by no means finite. And having a, an asset that uh, we know exactly ultimately how much it will ever be is something that is is unique and in itself is where a lot of value may reside. Hey, Chad, I don't want to derail the conversation okay. too much, but in the sense that it's finite, how do you think about the relationship between inflation on traditional dollars relative, relative to Bitcoin, both like in the short term, but I'm kind of more thinking like long term? Um, yeah, and that's something I'll, I'll get into more, I think, in a few minutes, but um, because one of the, in fact, I'll, I can get into it here, you know, um, where money as a store of value, and what I would say is, you know, sound money, right? Sound money is a place where we should be able to trust that we can store it, and it's not going to erode over time, right? And that speaks to, I think, your inflation question. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so for example, if I bought a dozen oranges and I plan to eat them over the course of the year, chances are before I can get to the end of the batch, like if I have one orange a month, by the time I get to those later months in the year, my oranges have eroded. 
you know, they, they, they decomposed. So I am disincentivized to put off eating oranges in the long run. If I know they're going to erode, I don't want to eat them more now. And that's the problem with having a, um, a, a monetary base that can be inflated or debased because people are not incentivized to store money for the future if their concern is that the value of it can erode over time. So when we compare that to you know, our fiat system, our dollar system in, in, in the United States, we've heard a lot about inflation recently. Like that's been in the headlines for the last year and a half or so. But even if the Fed had their way and the Fed could peg inflation to two or 3% a year or three or 4% a year, what that means is the value of our money is going to be cut in half every 18 to 24 years on a three to 4% inflationary rate. So we know that if we just hold money in, in our fiat currency over time, it's going to lose value, right? So when we look at Bitcoin, uh, we want to consider its, its, its uh, value proposition, if you will, in terms of not losing its value. Um, so that gets into the finite supply. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes in, in terms of how that works, if that's all right with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first is we want to have something that's going to be a, a sound store of value that we can trust will likely or, or not lose value over time in the future. The second thing is that money eventually should be a medium of exchange, which means multiple parties have to agree that it's a value and they want to transact with each other using that medium. And as the slide suggests over on the right, you know, the Austrian School of Economics doesn't stipulate what money is. It just says that it's the thing that serves as the generally accepted and commonly used medium of exchange. It specifically does not say that money must be the source of a central bank or government because money can take the form of many different things. So for money to be a medium of exchange, not only do we have to agree that it's a value, but it also has to be transferable. We have to be able to easily transfer it from one person to another, right? So if we're in front of each other, I can give you $20, it's very simple. If I wanna give you $30,000, that's a little bit more difficult because I might not feel so safe carrying thirty thousand dollars of cash with me, you know, on the subway trying to get uptown, you know, to where I'm going to be meeting Evan. Um, so um, that has its limits. Money also needs to be for a medium of exchange. It needs it needs to be divisible, right? So we have hundred dollar bills, ten dollar bills, one dollar bills, all the way down to the penny, uh, all the way down to the penny. This is where gold has its limitation, where it's not easily divisible. It's also not easily transferable, right? So with Bitcoin, we know that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever, ever created. Um, but each Bitcoin is divisible by 100 million units. Each unit is called a Satoshi, which is named after the creator or group of creators uh, believed to have created the whole Bitcoin ecosystem. So, because um, when you think about it, if there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever created, by definition, there's going to be very few people that ever could hold or own a full Bitcoin. There's just not enough Bitcoin for one full Bitcoin to be owned by everybody. So it has to be divisible. Um, so to give you some um, some color here, if, if um, Bitcoin were to go to a million dollars a coin, I'm not suggesting it will, but if it were to go to a million dollars a coin, um, then each Satoshi would be worth about a set. Okay, that's how we would think about that. Um, and in a million dollars a coin, that would be a $21 trillion asset as a market cap, which is equal roughly to about one and a half times the value of gold right now. Okay, so, but it's, it's that divisibility that's important. And the one final thing I'll say about that is, some people will say, well, if you can make a hundred trillion of these per Bitcoin, then it's really not limited. But that's like saying... You know, just because I can divide a dollar by a hundred pennies, the dollar is worth less somehow because I have a hundred pennies. A dollar is worth a dollar. A Bitcoin is worth a Bitcoin. It doesn't matter how much you slice up the pie by. No. Okay. So it's got to be divisible. It's got to be easily transferable. Yeah. <clears throat> and ultimately where money eventually moves to is that it becomes a unit of account, right? So if we say right now, Bitcoin is $65,000 a token, that's relative to the U.S. dollar. If I go to Europe, it's going to be relative to the euro. If I go to Japan, it's going to be relative to the yen. At some point, sound money becomes the unit of measurement, where one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, and it's not relative to anything else. We're far from that. But at some point, I think that's the grand vision 
uh, for a lot of people that are in the Bitcoin ecosystem of where it eventually is going to be going to. So in the grand vision, long term, less tied to inflation on the dollar, right? Like my where where I was going was if if the dollar is continually degraded by inflation, wouldn't the price of of Bitcoin have to increase just like everything else? All other asset values increase just to to keep up with inflation. Yeah. So what I would say is. Um, it's possible that Bitcoin isn't increasing in value as it has been on its own. It may be increasing in value relative to the dollar because mm -hmm. the dollar has been decreasing in value. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that's the way I might think about that from an inflationary perspective. Um, but when we think about digital money, like this concept of digital money, it actually to me seems to be like the natural progression of where money should go when we think about the digitizing of so many other things in our world, right? So we have what starts as the analog world and over time it evolves into the digital world, right? So we started with physical books. When I was a kid, I would go to the library and I would actually go research with things in the encyclopedia. And I there would be like a Dewey Decimal System for me to locate books on shelves somewhere in the library. Like kids don't go to libraries. Kids go to the internet because everything is moved on to a digital format where all information is accessible, you know, on a phone or a laptop, right? When we think about film, right? Like uh, you come back from vacation, you had 36 pictures you could take on one roll of film. You hope that some of those pictures came back good, but now we can take unlimited amounts of pictures, store them in the cloud, and, and the quality of those pictures is better than any camera we ever had before. Um, you know, snail mail, taking days and days and days to get or longer to get from one person to another. Now we can instantly send an email in a digital version from one person to another. And we can send it out to many people at once. You know, AM, FM radio compared to streaming music on demand on Spotify, uh, VHS and DVDs. Now we've got streaming movies on any number of different services that we can all subscribe to. You know, and when you think about it, in, in I think in, in every example here, and I'm sure people can come up with, you know, uh, it, you know, exclusions here, but in, in every single, single example of when analog has moved into digital, the digital version became a more perfect version than the original analog version itself. And in the same way, paper money, fiat money moving into a digital world seems to be the next evolution. And, uh, you know, right now the total market cap of Bitcoin is somewhere around <laughs> 1.2 to 1.3 trillion dollars. Um, and I think that is partly represented by the fact that people are just slowly um, transitioning money from the analog world of maybe traditional stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever it may, wherever they otherwise might have stored money into a different type of asset class in a digital format. All right. And what we see again with a digital format is we can transfer it quicker, more easily across the globe without being, you know, uh, held inside of a box of certain banking hours or having to change from one currency to the next. We can do it at very, very low cost, lower than the cost of a Western Union or a traditional wire. So we're beginning to see that as, as it picks up adoption, this digital version of money in many ways is a more perfect version than the original analog version. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, in terms of like, you know, where do assets get their value, right? So, the, you know, because one of the big understandable concerns, skepticism, cynicism behind Bitcoin is that it doesn't it doesn't hold value. There's nothing backing it. So I want to try to address that as well, because if we look at traditional assets like stocks, you know, stocks are very often, uh, their, their value is often determined by their, their cash flow, their profits, their underlying assets. You know, bonds pay dividend, uh, bonds pay interest, stocks pay dividends. People, you know, certainly uh, derive a lot of value from that. You know, Bitcoin derives value in other ways, right? So one way is that because it doesn't generate cash flow and it has no underlying assets, in large, in large part, it relies on supply and demand, right? And like anything, the more people that want it and if it's going against an ever decreasing supply which i'll get into in just probably the next slide um that in part is what's helping lift the value of it so just simple supply and demand dynamic <clears throat> but again going back to what i said earlier you know there's 
there is lowercase Bitcoin, the token, but let's not forget what's backing that token. And that's the network. The network is what I believe is really giving Bitcoin its, its value. Um, and what I've learned is that the network is backed by four major components, right? The first is political power. And by political power, I mean, there's over a hundred million people on the network now. And the adoption rate is, is picking up pretty fast, arguably faster than some of the early days of the internet. So you have a lot of people that have a vested interest in the network. The second is a monetary power. Right? So as I mentioned before, the value of Bitcoin as we sit here right now is about 1.2 to $1.3 trillion. If that was a publicly traded company, that would fall somewhere around seven or eight of all capitalized companies. So it's a pretty significant asset at this point. There's computing power. The computing power of the network, which again is a decentralized network of computers, uh, is, is what's called, uh, it's, it's measured by exahash and there's 600 exahash per second computing power. So what a hash rate is without getting too technical is like a rolling of the dice. It is an attempt to solve a very complex cryptographic mathematical problem within a network. That's what's happening with a hash. Every hash is another roll of the dice to try to solve a mathematical problem to verify a transaction on the blockchain. Now it's a lot there. I don't expect you all to get it, but to try to, you know, to try to drive home like the power of that network for every star in the galaxy, the Bitcoin network performs 5 billion calculations per second. Um, it would take over 2000 years for the entire world's population producing one hash per person to reach the Bitcoin hash rate. Or one final analogy, it produces about 67 times more hashes per second than known grains of sand on earth. That is incredible, incredible computing power. And that hash rate has been exponentially increasing monthly as more and more users enter the network and the mathematical problems required to solve within the network become more and more complex. And finally, there's electrical power backing this network. Mm. And it requires a tremendous amount of electricity to power these computers, to power these rigs, to power the nodes that are verifying the transactions along the way. Um, and that in itself has a lot of value, right? So we have monetary value, we have political, we have monetary power, political power, computing power, and electrical power all backing this network. To me, that has value. Right, any questions about that? Because that's sort of the technical stuff. No, I want to save my questions to the end. I want to make sure you, you have yeah, enough yeah. time to get through everything. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm watching the time here. So uh, in, in terms of supply, um, as I mentioned before, there will only be 21 million Bitcoin ever in circulation. And we want to understand how that kind of unfolds over time. So on January 3rd, 2009, the first uh, 50 Bitcoin were mined on the Genesis block. So you can see here that it started out very low. And then each year there was actually a very fast ramp up or relatively large inflation rate in terms of the amount of new tokens that sort of entering the, that started to enter the network. But because we started with 21 million, every time new tokens entered the network, our available remaining supply continued to go down. So we're 15 years in to this Bitcoin experience. And in those 15 years, uh, about 19.6 million Bitcoin have been mined, or almost 94% of all Bitcoin that will ever be mined. So in the first 15 years, approximately 94% of all Bitcoin that will ever be available is already out there. What we also know, based on the protocol, is that the last Bitcoin will not be mined or issued until the year approximately 2140. So it's gonna take another 115 years to get the last 1.4 million Bitcoin issued. Now, a lot of that is because of the protocol and what's known as a halving schedule. And you might've just heard about that kind of in social media, because this just happened last Friday night, where every four years, the amount of Bitcoin that is available as an issuance, not what's already issued, but as new Bitcoin gets issued, that gets cut in half. So in the first four years, every block, every 10 minutes, 50 new Bitcoin got mined. 
Four years later, 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes got mined. Then it became 12 and a half, then 6.25, and now every 10 minutes, 3.125 Bitcoin get mined. So what you have uh, is, an, is a deflationary experience with the issuance of these tokens. That is a very, very different phenomenon, the exact inverse of what we see happening in the traditional monetary system, where more and more money gets created over time, which has the perhaps unintended consequence of creating inflationary environments over time. For reference, we're uh, recording this April 25th, 2024. Which is an important, yeah, it's an important thing to kind of know because you want to always be able to refer back to that. <laughs> um, so this, th this I think, is what is uh, appealing to people because there certainly has been a lot of adoption. Um, one of the reasons we're able to have this conversation right now is that ETFs for Bitcoin now exist. Um, so now it's, it's a regulated security. That is something that we can talk to our clients about. Um, but what those ETFs have done has kind of accelerate demand above where it was before because demand for the ETFs have been pretty, po pretty popular by basically every measure of an ETF. So we have uh, a greater adoption. Uh, we have different ways of accessing the market that we didn't have before intersecting with an ever decreasing of new supply available. The one last thing I just want to say about this is that there, there is something called stock to flow. This is how we value oftentimes uh, an asset. So stock is how much of that asset exi exists right now. Flow is how much new of that asset can get created. So when we think about our, our basic currency, the dollar, the, the stock to flow isn't the most advantageous ratio because there's a lot in place and unlimited amounts in theory can, get, can, can continue to be created over time, right? If we look at gold, there's a lot of gold in place because it's been around for thousands of years. And we know that only the expansion of gold is two to 3% a year. So that's a much more favorable stock to flow ratio. When you look at Bitcoin, it's even more favorable because the flow becomes less and less and less and less because of that having schedule, because of the design deflationary schedule. So again, when we compare it to inflation, we're trying to solve for inflation where we don't have to worry about our oranges being eroded. At the end of the year, we hopefully can have more trust that the value is going to hold. All right now, we can't talk about Bitcoin if we don't talk about certain benefits and risks. So I want to go through this and then leave it to more of a conversational format in the time that we have left. Some of the uh, benefits of Bitcoin, certainly it has high historical returns. If you look at the last 11 years or so, um, eight of those last 11 years, it's been among, if not the highest performing asset class. Uh, if we if we look over here, we can look at a five-year schedule from where the S&P started tracking it. Uh, and the five-year return as of the end of 2023 is a compounded 62% return a year, right? So that in no way is to infer that that will be the continued trajectory, but just looking retrospectively compared to other types of asset classes, it's a very compelling return. It offers diversification benefits, right? So if we're, if we're, if we're trying to create, uh, you know, if we're trying to position portfolios to maximize returns, we're also trying to do it on a risk adjusted basis. And as we're able to introduce new kinds of asset classes, uh, you know, Bitcoin is a non-market correlated asset. So it's a way of creating a diversification benefit um, in addition to any other things that we might put into a portfolio. Again, it's pretty widespread adoption, at least relative to any other <laughs> cryptocurrency out there. And that fixed supply, um, I think, is what creates a lot of value in a lot of people's perceptions about why they would want to store their money there as they, as they measure it against other potential asset classes. In terms of risks, absolutely, volatility is a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. You don't get 62% compounded returns if you're not going to deal with volatility on the other side, right? So, um, you know, I, I was taught long ago that volatility is like a funnel. It's like a it's like a tornado where when you first go in, the volatility is greatest because you have the smallest amount of time. But as you allow longer and longer investment horizons, that funnel and the volatile and the volatility narrows over time. So in any short period of time, you're going to see Bitcoin being a very volatile asset. But if you allow it to zoom out over a longer period of time, and this is 
which should be looked at as a long-term type of asset, um, that volatility does diminish. But again, in short periods of time, it is a very, very volatile asset, and it requires a certain constitution to be able to weather that storm in hopes of getting the upside of that as well. Um, relatively low regulation, as I mentioned, you know, we, we only now have Bitcoin ETFs, but there's a whole other way of accessing Bitcoin um, directly that is not as regulated. So, um, and it's not as it's not a, as much of a known entity because it's only been around for 15 years. So that's something to to, to keep in mind. And uh, and you know, because of that, there's not a lot of historical data. I mean, I feel better talking about this with a 15 year mm -hmm. look yep. back than I do a two or three year look back. Um, and seeing the investments and the adoption and and the uh, narratives that are circling Bitcoin every day and expanding, I, I have an ever increasing confidence with you know what the network could be going forward. But still, it's a relatively new asset that um, you know that people have to consider that. So I think uh, you know that was a lot. I don't yeah that was a lot there. Um, but maybe we could turn it to conversation or questions or comments because yeah. I mean Chet, Ch when you think about it's funny because I think a lot of the advantages of blockchain and Bitcoin for some are are considered advantages and for some considered disadvantages in this just the way they view the risk, right? So I'll give you an example. Like the not having it be decentralized and not having a governing entity look at the currency is scary for some and a great thing for others, right? It's very funny how, you know, you can kind of make one statement around the 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 currency and, and it can be a benefit and a detractor for, for 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 different people. Yeah, and I think that's why people go into it with skepticism and cynicism, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't understand cryptography and you don't understand blockchain technology and you don't understand what an open source protocol means, yeah, that 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 is beyond a leap of faith. And yeah. I think like anything, you know, there are other things that we talk to our clients about that, you know, if if you don't do the work, you're not going to believe in it and you're not going to understand it. But if you do the work and you invest the time, then you you do, I think, increase your level of comfort and confidence with what it means to be decentralized and not have that central entity yeah. you know, being in control. I think the frictionless aspect of the currency and just being able to do business is something that's incredibly attractive for me, right? So you and I have talked about it before, but like you go into a bank or you try to make a transaction and, you know, on a Friday afternoon, and if it's post banking hours, then you try to do that. It won't clear until Wednesday of the next week, perhaps. And and like like for the younger generation and even younger than that, like that, that seems asinine right that seems like a completely foreign idea that it would take five calendar days for a transaction to go through where things happen instantaneously in in sort of the rest of their lives right so um why would the banking system be any different and i think that that's you know a, a real advantage of of the the blockchain and sort of cryptocurrency in general yeah i mean i i i, I think that there will be a time when our kids generation will walk into a bank and you know somebody once said you know two days for what? And it's going to cost me how much to do that? You know, and I got to deal with a currency exchange and I got to deal with a foreign exchange market. Like that, I, you know, I, I think, and again, I want to be clear about this also. And another point here is that one of the concerns is that central banks will never allow Bitcoin to become successful because central banks never want to give up power nor do the governments that control mm -hmm. that that local currency, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important distinction because when Bitcoin first came out, I think that there were a lot of people that were just, you know, very myopic in their view, which is Bitcoin um, is uh, the currency and the only currency that we can have. And as soon as you say that, you are in direct opposition to some of the most powerful forces that exist in our world. And that's not a place you want to be. But if we can make the distinction that Bitcoin is a store of value and that a local currency native to the country that you are in will likely always be there, I think what, what, what that will look like is um, I will travel to Europe and I will have Bitcoin as a store of value. And when, when I want to exchange, there'll be an off-ramp. I'll go from the Bitcoin network into the Euro network and I'll transact. 
but I'm not going to keep my money in fiat where I believe it's going to erode over time. And if I'm in Japan, I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to do the same thing in Australia. So I think that there's a place for a local currency and a Bitcoin quote unquote currency to coexist. And we need to be very careful about that narrative because we have a really compelling technology and we don't want to shoot it in the foot because we didn't get the narrative right. Mm -hmm. So your so your your thought process is, you know, again, people have their concepts or ideas. So your thought is this is not just going to replace all the global currencies. This is really technology that can enhance the experience of people when they go to use those currencies in different places. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a combination of that. And look, there are countries like El Salvador. El Salvador mm -hmm. is, I think, the first example of a country that is that has adopted Bitcoin as its official currency. Um, I think there will be other developing countries, perhaps, that look to do the same thing. Um, and there'll be plenty of countries. So, like in that case, yeah, you're gonna trade in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is gonna be the local currency. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have the euros and the dollars mm -hmm. and the yens and 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 all the other larger, more powerful currencies. That are, um, I don't think are going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, in which there is room and space to coexist between those two networks. I do wonder how governments try to regulate it over over time. I mean, it just seems inevitable that because they're fighting for their to keep their power, you know, they'll they'll try and do so with regulation. But I guess you never know how they go about doing that. Yeah, I mean, look, we can we can look at China. China's banned Bitcoin more than once. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem that when countries ban Bitcoin, it actually increases the value of Bitcoin because the signal that it sends is it works. Right, <laughs> right. Countries are getting rid of it because there's something here. Yeah, they're scared so, of it. They're scared of it. Yeah, so let's let's create a narrative where they don't need to be scared. Let's create a narrative where we need local currency and we need uh, more dependable stores of value. Um, that are not designed in a way to erode over time. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I think, you know, at least here in the States, right? So now it's becoming a little bit more, I'll call it legitimized, right? In the mainstream. So now we've got these spot BT, spot ETF that are available. Um, the government sort of figured out a way to tax the growth on this, right? And so, you know, those sorts of things become, and when, I feel like whenever the government has an opportunity to, to sort of get their arms around it, collect their tax dollars, and it becomes more legitimate than it was before, right. um, whether the, whether or not that's true or not is sort of that that's my opinion on it. But I think you know the opportunity to kind of figure out and have some regulation around it, have large institutions like BlackRock, you know, backing these these ETFs, and, and you know, may, it makes it a little bit more, I'll say, mainstream, right, available to folks to kind of wrap their arms around. Um, but given your sort of slide on on the risk profile around it you've got to take you know your um you, what what your constitution is around this risk extremely s seriously right it's not mm -hmm. the same risk profile as other asset classes um so you really got to kind of understand you know what what kind of appetite you have for for it there yeah and look like 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 investing in the stock market it, it is not a six month recommended type of thing like you have to have a mature patient approach to what that asset means over time, recognizing it will increase in value and decrease in value. And, and I think Bitcoin is the exact same thing, which is you have to have a mature, patient, long-term approach. And the more you learn it, the more comfortable you get with withstanding that type of volatility. Absolutely. Chet, any, any, as we kind of wrap this up, are there any other things that you think the listening audience should know about um, about this or, you know, any anything in particular that you think is is a driving driving point that you want them to leave with? Um, I think, look, after 15 years, it, it's kind of like the Internet. You, you, the Internet started in one way. The initial, the initial um, version of the internet never imagined that we would be interacting with each other. We would be doing financial transactions the way we do, that it would be as dynamic as it was, right? It was a read-only format. It was mm -hmm. limited in content and it evolved in a way that is inescapable in our everyday existence. Like we are talking to each other right now in ways that never could have been imagined when the internet first came out. 
-hmm. And you could you could have chosen to ignore it for a really long time, but eventually the internet didn't care. The internet became a part of our lives and we had to become a part of the internet. I would think about Bitcoin now at the same place as the early stages of the internet where it's becoming things that maybe initially we never could have imagined it would have been. And we can choose to avoid it or ignore it as long as we want. But at some point, it's quite possible that Bitcoin becomes a part of our life and our lives are gonna become a part of Bitcoin. And just in case that happens, the sooner we take it more seriously, the sooner we start doing the work and educating ourselves and you know, reading the books that are available to us or the podcasts that are out there or the YouTube videos or, you know, whatever it is, I think it's incumbent on people that are serious about their money to take a look at this asset class and get educated about it just to see what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chad, listen, we really, really appreciate you coming on, having the conversation, educating the audience on, on this topic. Um, it's been, you know, wonderful to hear you explain it to me three times and I still don't fully <laughs> understand it, but I, yeah. but I, I, I'm, I'm in a significantly better place than I was when, when, when we first had the conversation. So I, again, I appreciate it. And uh, to you, the listening audience, thanks for tuning in. Please click subscribe below to be notified when we have our next episode. Cool.